Hello? Hello? Tá funcionando? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Okay, so should we get started? I know we people are still arriving, so we can start slow. So how tired are you all? Tired? Yeah, 10? But think like it's week it's the weekend tomorrow. So let's give it a last push and try to finish the school on a high note. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about models. Um, I chose a few models so we can talk about some models that are interesting, some models that have interesting cosmological consequences. Uh, so yeah, so today, yesterday we talked about many things and today we're going to talk about models. But let's just do a quick recap and then we give time for people to arrive again. So there's a huge amount of evidence for the existence of dark matter as we reviewed uh, the main ones. And each of those evidences tell us a little bit about the properties of dark matter, the bounds that we can have on the mass, on the charge, on the self-interaction and everything. So although we don't know what dark matter is, we learn a lot with those evidences and we learn a lot about the properties of dark matter by, by having cosmological and astrophysical observations. Oh, you're taking a picture. Go. <laughs> and then, uh, giving all this observation and also a little bit of theory, we could construct our, what I'm calling here, dark matter builder's guide. <laughs> uh, so if you want to construct a dark matter model, you have to take all of this into account. So first, it has to be non-relativistic today or warm. So if it's a thermal candidate, the mass needs to be bigger than KV or produced already cold non-thermally in the universe. It has to reproduce the large and small scales distribution that we have. And again, remember the power spectrum. We measure the power spectrum quite well until something around 10 to 20 uh, megaparsec inverse. Uh, and that um, is really well measured with a lot of precision. Besides that, on nonlinear scales, we observe galaxies, we observe profiles of how the dark matter behaves in halos and everything. So dark matter has to follow this distribution on large and small scales. Although the small scales are highly unconstrained and we have a lot of freedom to play around with models of dark matter there. It has to be non-interacting or just weakly interacting. So we know it's interacting gravitationally, that's the evidence, but it can have a melee charge. Uh, it can self-interact a little bit, there are bounds or you can interact with a weak force. We know it's abundance from CMB, quite well measured. And if a particle, I'm not saying it has to be a particle, but if you invoke a solution that is a particle, it needs to be stable. So it needs to be a particle that is around here, it's not decaying. So it has to be a lifetime of the order of the age of the universe. So this is how, those are the conditions you need to have to construct a dark matter model. And then there's the mass bounds that we talked about. So here is the warm dark matter KEV limit. So from here on, dark matter can be thermally produced. So if, if it's heavy, more heavier than KEV, it can be in equilibrium with the photon uh, baryon plasma. For lighter masses, it has to be non-thermal. This morning, we did a very good exercise about the remain unbound. So when it can be a fermion and when it has to be a boson, right? So if you're constructing something with a particle, you have to worry about the spin. So there's a bound for that. Uh, it can be a particle until this point. So yesterday we talked about the unitary bound and I wanna correct something that maybe was not clear. The unitary bound is the maximum a mass that dark matter has to have to be a particle and to be thermally produced. So I can have particle dark matter that is heavier than this, but it has to be produced non-thermally. So I added this here. So it can still be a particle if it's heavier than 100 TeV, but it has to be produced non-thermally. Heavier than that, we probably need to have some macroscopic object or a compo composite uh, object like an atom dark matter or a primordial black hole or something like that. And giving all of those conditions, 
we have a huge amount of dark matter models. So this is the landscape of dark matter models. And this is amazing. So it spans 80 to 90 orders of magnitude in mass and invokes completely different physical mechanisms to explain what dark matter is. From new fundamental particles that are going to complement the standard model, to permodal black holes, which are very massive, to dark matter that behaves like a wave, uh, to dark atoms and very different things. So we have many ideas. We have many different types of dark matter with different, um, I don't know, different properties that can explain all of those properties that we measure. So although dark matter is really well measured, we know quite well its properties, it still allows a huge amount of models. And today we're going to talk about them. But first, as I promised, let's talk a little bit about bond. As you can see here, there's a little corner here that says maybe dark matter can be described by modified gravity. So what do we mean by that? And is it true? So bond, the name that no one can say. So how is it in the Harry Potter, the one that we cannot say? I don't remember. So something like that. So bond, it stands for modifying Newtonian dynamics. And what it is bond? So remember the rotation curve that we learned, right? So we have here the rotation curve, velocity versus distance. And we saw that uh, if we apply Newtonian theory, right? So here we see how the velocity changes with the radius. To explain the observational signatures, we have to have more mass in our galaxy. So that is how we explain dark matter in galaxies. However, one can say maybe this formula is wrong. Maybe in galaxies, here is okay, it's Newtonian dynamics works, we measure quite well. But maybe in galaxies, we have to modify this law. And this is the idea about MOND. But there's a few types of MOND. Uh, so there's the empirical relation. So Milgram in 1983, he proposed an empirical relation for, for how uh, gravity works in different scales. So he said, the acceleration that we have in a system is going to follow the Newtonian acceleration if I'm in places where the acceleration is large. So in places where I have large accelerations, it follows a Newtonian dynamics. It follows exactly this. Uh, and this is like the beginning of this curve. But in other places where the acceleration is small, we have to take this geometric mean here of uh, the Newtonian acceleration and this parameter A naught that you get from the scaling relations and everything. And this is an empirical relation. There's no modified gravity here in the sense that I'm going to, like this is the Levon spoke today. It was just an empirical fact. And he got this from fitting curves. So he got a bunch of rotation curves, started fitting those curves and realized that this works. And I'm going to tell you something, it works better than Newtonian physics. So if you talk to someone that fits rotation curves, day-to-day -day job is just to fit rotation curves. They are going to say that this type of empirical relation works quite well, better than Newtonian physics. Um, right, and also it explains the, remember we talked about the bionic solification relation. So this very tight correlation between the velocity uh, and the mass. What lambda CDM cannot explain, this empirical relation can. So if we're not thinking about modifying gravity, this works. So the question now is, why does it work and how can we make this into a paradigm that makes sense? And that's when Milgram came and said, let's modify gravity. Let's write a modified gravity theory that has this acceleration. And this means that I don't need dark matter then, right? So this modified gravity theory is going to be used to explain Dark, explain dark matter. So explain the evidence for dark matter without having dark matter. So it's a theory without dark matter. So he modified gravity to, in order to explain this empirical relation. But there is a problem with this. It works quite well to describe galaxies, but it fails to describe, to describe the evidence for dark matter in clusters and on large scales. So in the end, this type of empirical relation or it's uh, modified gravity theory, which is what we actually call MOND, 
doesn't work on scales larger than the galaxy. And then some people came and said, oh, wait, 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 it's because we have to generalize to relativistic theory. So then there's those Tevis theories by Mond and other theories that try to generalize the Mond theory to uh, a relativistic theory. And they, again, don't work quite well. Or they only work if I still have to add dark matter, but in a different quantity than what we have for standard model. And usually the main problem is CMB in large scale structure. It's very, very hard to explain CMB in large scale structure without dark matter. And we have such an amazing precision that we measure the amount of matter in the CMB in the large scale structure. So usually all the modified gravity theories for dark matter, what they really don't cannot explain or they fail to explain is the large scale structures and CMB. So in this sense, CMB is like the main evidence for dark matter or having an extra component. So in 2020, um, these guys here made a new theory that could actually explain CMB. So the jury is out, but they cannot explain large scale structure yet. And also this theory is like a modified gravity theory like Levon showed, so you have extra degrees of freedom. Isn't that the same thing as adding a dark matter component? So there's a lot of discussion in the literature. I just wanted to talk about this. This is definitely not the mainstream topic for dark matter. This is not the mainstream <laughs> explanation or something that everybody's working on. But I just wanted to talk about this because you guys should know what it is. It's like a cultural note. But also you should know that the evidence that we have for dark matter is the evidence for extra gravity. We never have an evidence that says it's a particle. It's something extra. We interpret like this. And it's a very good interpretation because it works for all the scales and all the evidence. So that's why we think dark matter is an extra component um, in the standard model. But I just wanted you guys to have this, um, this knowledge about MOND. Because usually when you ask people about MOND, they are just like, oh, don't talk about it. We should talk about it. We should know where it's bad, where it fails, how people are trying to fix it, right? Um, although you might not like it, uh, right? Um, but <laughs> just a note. Okay, let's go to lecture two, dark matter models. So now we're assuming there is something extra in the universe, an extra component that follows all of those bounds that we talked about last class. So again, this is the landscape. So we have many models. And of course, I'm going to show a very biased view. I'm not going to review each one of them, especially after lunch, you guys would sleep. So I chose a few models and I'm skipping a few. So please come and talk to me later if your preferred model was not described here. So let's start with particle dark matter. So particle dark matter is spans for all of these possible mass ranges. Uh, so let's start with the most famous and I would say the preferred candidate for dark matter, which is WIMPs. So WIMPs stands for weakly interacting massive particle. And as the name says, you can already understand that it interacts with a weak force, but weakly. <laughs> so it's the most accepted candidate, is the candidate that if you, again, I repeat what I said yesterday, if this lecture was being given five to 10 years ago, this is all we would be talking about. Not all, but 95%. So WIMP is the main candidate. It is where we're spending the money, have been spending the money for all the, this, for many years to try to look for dark matter. So the WIMP is basically, you assume that it is going to be a particle beyond the standard model that has mass. Uh, and the, what is the range of masses for WIMP? Oh, let me go back to this. So, Different people call WIMP different things. So some people call WIMP uh, between GV and TV, which usually was proposed because you have supersymmetric candidates for dark matter that are within this range. But you also have sub GV dark matter that some people call light dark matter, but some people also call WIMP. So just so you know, WIMP is going to be a candidate that is within this range of masses. But the traditional, traditional WIMP range of mass is between GV and TV. And why WIMP is so famous? Why does everybody like WIMP? Like Vera said this morning, 
having thermal candidates for dark matter, it's very, it makes sense. We know how to calculate the abundance. We know what is the temperature. We know exactly how to calculate and we can make very precise statements about, about its production and abundance. So WIMP has what they call WIMP miracle. You might like this word or not, but basically, and Vera is going to talk more about this. So that's why I'm going super quick through WIMP. Basically tells you that WIMP is going to be this thermal relic, right? So it was in thermal equilibrium in the early universe that has a cross section that is of the order of the weak interaction. So if it, is, if it has a cross section of the order of the weak interaction, it's going to freeze out uh, with a density and we have today a density that is exactly the density that we need for dark matter. So basically, if you calculate the abundance here, and this is the annihilation cross section, you see that if you have a cross section of this order, which is the expected cross section for weak interactions, you get perfectly the density of dark matter that you would expect today. So basically you assume there is a massive particle, it weak, uh, interacts weakly in thermal equilibrium with the universe, because of freeze out, you can calculate its abundance and it matches perfectly with the abundance of, abundance of dark matter that we measure today. So that's what we call, right? <laughs> so people were very excited. Um, so that's why WIMP is something people really like, right? You can explain, it's an easy explanation, it's an allowed interaction, it's an extra particle, and it has many models that can explain WIMP. Um, I think Vera is going to talk more about that, so I'm going really quickly through WIMP. Um, and how do we measure it? How do we see that there is WIMPs in the universe? So again, this type of diagram that is wrong, right? It, could, you, it, it doesn't have to be a two by two collision, but it's just to illustrate. So dark matter can interact with the standard model as we just saw it has the weak interaction. So it can interact with the standard model and can interact gravitationally. <laughs> Sorry. And then you can try to measure it gravitationally. So the evidence is that we have, or maybe something else or through collider experiments, direct detection or indirect detection. Just a second. Sorry. And with the dark detection, usually we have experiments like dark matter scattering against nuclei. So you have those recoil experiments. So dark matter heats the experiment, the gas that you have, and then you measure the recoil of the gas. You also have indirect detection experiments like the annihilation of dark matter in astrophysical environments. So are uh, the products of this annihilation. So dark matter could produce an electron positron and then you measure this electron positron or it can decay into photons and you can measure this. So everybody must have heard about those lines, excess that we measure in astrophysics. And those could be um, an indication that we have dark matter as a WIMP in that GV to TV mass range. And it can be produced in colliders. So you can try to find it as the, as the product of a collider. Uh, this is not up to date, but these are the bounds in the WIMP mass. So here's mass and here's the WIMP nuclear cross section. And you can see here that we don't have a detection, of course, but we have been putting bounds and bounds and bounds and bounds in dark matter. It is a huge experimental effort. So like I told you, dark matter has been WIMP forever, right? Uh, it is the main paradigm. The main experiments have been done in the past few years on that. So a huge experimental effort has been done, but it was still not detected. So we still have not been able to see WIMP. So we have been pushing those bounds lower and lower and lower every year with every experiment. But also don't think, okay, there's no WIMPs. We're spending too much money on that. It's very hard to make those ex exclusion limits or bounds. They're very hard to interpret, right? So let's get this simple scattering here. So you can say that this is scattering in this way, or you can say that there is a mediator between the scattering, or you can say that this scattering happens in a different way. And then those bounds shift. So we don't know what dark matter is. So we don't quite know, quite understand perfectly those 
scatterings. So it could be that there is a mediator I'm not taking into account or something else I'm not taking into account to construct these bounds. And this can really shift the bound. So I wouldn't take the fact that we have not been detecting the, new, the, the wind pass the fact that, okay, we should abandon that paradigm, not at all. It's very hard to interpret this, the result of those experiments. Yes. Well, what's the main reason for the loss of sensitivity at higher mass ranges in these experiments? Is it because the number density that we would assume is much lower? Or at where? Sorry, in the at, at, at higher mass ranges. Oh, higher mass the ranges. Sensitivity of the experiment seems to worsen. Um, um, that's a good question. I don't. Know. We have experimentalists here. Do you know? Do you know so the? You're experimental, it's in dark matter, right? No, I, no? Yes, but I, I think it is I think it is due to the number density. The number density? Yeah, if you if you keep like the mass of the molecular halo constant and you decrease the mass of the individual particles, the number density goes down. Goes down, yeah. Mm -hmm. that lower rate. Makes sense. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then I said WIMPs are very people really like them and really like them, especially in this GV to TV range. And this is because of supersymmetry. So we have a lot of supersymmetric particles that if you say that the universe has supersymmetry, right? This is a symmetry of our universe. So all of our standard model is going to have supersymmetric symmetric partners. So we have the standard model and we have the supersymmetric partners. In those theories, new particles are going to pop up that have exactly the properties that we need. They're highly massive, they are stable, and they could be dark matter. And we have many of them. We have neutralino, gravitino, chargino, and many others. And even better, that makes people really want to see them is that you can search for them at colliders. So this is a big search that they have at LHC. Uh, I show here a few of the, the limits, but again, we still did not see it. So another day without seeing supersymmetry and without seeing dark matter in colliders. But again, very hard. Um, what about if I go a higher mass than what my thermal limit for particle dark matter uh, uh, allows me? And then we have WIMP zillas. So WIMP zillas basically are super heavy candidates for dark matter. They were proposed by uh, Coben collaborators in 98. Um, and they're basically just super heavy particles. They must be stable, of course, to be particle dark matter. And they must be produced known thermally. Again, remember that the unitary bound here is a bound for, for the particle dark matter that is produced thermally. So I can produce super heavy particles. So the WIMP zillas have. Uh, a mass around 10 to the 9 GV to 10 to the 16 GV because they are produced during inflation. Uh, and remember, like the Planck scale is 10 to the 19 GV. So this is really high mass. And they, so they need to be produced in the early universe. They need to be produced non thermally. Um, and they are candidates for dark matter. So there's currently no search, no experiments to exclude our search for Rimpsilis. They are just a proposed dark matter model. And to prove to you that people that do dark matter are nine-year-olds at heart, there's an A wimp, right? Wimpy. And they say wimp zillas because the size does matter. So that is the, actually in the paper, the, the scientific paper of wimp zillas. And you're going to see other examples around here. Okay, so this is particle dark matter. I wanna go to higher masses. Can I have dark matter candidates that have higher masses? So if I go to higher masses than this, I need to have then macroscopic or composite dark matter models. So dark matter cannot be one elementary particle anymore. Uh, it has to be made of a composite of something. And here are some examples of composite dark matter. For example, you have dark atoms. You have those dark glue balls that are just uh, composite of gluons without the quarks, it's just, a bunch of gluons glued together. Or you can even have an entire dark sector, uh, an entire standard model dark sector 
um, propose. So you have the dark sector that we measure, and then you have a dark, dark sector, oh, sorry, a dark standard model, something like that. Um, and there's a bunch of those models. One model that I won't have time to talk about here, but I would love you guys to go search for it a little bit better, is atomic dark matter. So atomic dark matter was a model that yesterday we talked a lot about. We use as a prototypical example for a model that suppresses the power spectrum. Plus, because of health interaction, you have those dark acoustic oscillations. So as we have the baryon acoustic oscillations, atomic dark matter can have dark acoustic oscillations. And this, although this is not in the range of case that we measure with large scales, this could have very interesting consequences, observational consequences on small scale. So how is the dark matter density in a galaxy if I have those dark um, acoustic oscillations? So I don't have time to talk about it, but I really think it's an interesting model to look for with a lot of uh, observational signatures that we can go and look for them in the near future. And to prove that they are dynear odds, machos, which are answer to WIMP. So again, in the paper of machos, they say, oh, if you don't like the wimpy WIMPs, search for the machos. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I'm not going to say what I'm thinking, but yeah. So machos mainly says massive compacted halo object. So basically, those are those macroscopic astrophysical objects that can behave like dark matter. The most famous example of them, and it is a topic that has been growing a lot lately, that has been becoming very important again, is primordial black holes. So what is primordial black holes? So we know that black holes exist by now, right? It, like who said it yesterday that if you got a Nobel Prize, it exists? I think it was LeBon, right? It got a Nobel Prize, it exists. But uh, the, the, the reason why we think there are black holes are many different evidences, right? The, we see it directly, but also gravitational waves and the motion around them. But could it be primordial black holes? What I mean by primordial black holes, those are black holes formed in the earlier times in, of our universe, maybe during inflation or right after inflation or in other early universe uh, scenarios. Uh, and if they exist, can they explain part of all the dark matter? Uh, so there are many types of formation mechanisms for them. So if you like our universe cosmology, um, you can see a few of them. So for example, if I have a model in my early universe that produces bubbles. So bubbles are just first order phase transitions that occur in the early universe. So for whatever reason in your universe, you write a theory that has a first order phase transition that creates bubbles. Those bubbles can collide. Uh, and those are very energetic events where you have a high density. And then you can form primordial black holes where those bubbles collide. Uh, you can have also models that have cosmic string loops. So what are cosmic strings? So cosmic strings are, again, topological defects that are formed, again, when you have a symmetry breaking. But you have to have that the topology of the vacuum is a topology like this. So it can create a 2D object. So the cosmic string, nothing more than is. It is like, because the vacuum of this, um, this Mexican hat potential uh, is now the generate, right? So then your vacuum now is not one point anymore, but it is here and 1D uh, object. Then you produce strings. They are really just really long strings. And those strings can interact and form loops. Uh, here's one loop, here's another loop. And those loops, they are going to form over density. So whatever thing that you have in the universe is going to clump around those, and then you can form a black hole. But the most famous mechanism to form a black hole is just the collapse of density perturbations. So let's say I have an inflationary model that allows me to have overdense regions, dense enough that can produce black holes right in the beginning of the universe. So dark stellar black holes, we know that they are made because you have a star, right? And so it exploded, something happened, and then it collapsed and it becomes a black hole. Here's the same mechanism 
for some reason, you created the inflation or any other mechanism over densities that were dense enough to, that they could collapse into black holes. Uh, a little bit more quantitatively, so if I have a density perturbation in the early universe that is large, and when I mean large, it is larger at a horizon crossing, so Hubble radius crossing, it is larger than this uh, value, the critical value here, which in radiation domination is one third. Um, you're going to have that this collapses into a black hole like it's here. So the, here, the perturbation, it's outside the Hubble radius. So it, when it enters the Hubble radius, it can collapse and form a black hole. Uh, so you're going to form a black hole that has the same mass as the, all the mass that is encompassed in the Hubble radius. So you're going to have the size of your Hubble radius and also the mass. Um, you can also compute the initial mass fraction of primordial black holes. Um, so this is a fraction of the universe in regions that are dense enough. So how many dense enough regions do I have that can form primordial black holes? So this is the fraction between the amount of black holes and the total energy density. And if I assume a Gaussian distribution, this is something like this. So I have here a probability density of having a primordial black hole. Uh, this is the variance. So every time that this is smaller than uh, this uh, critical density, I have the formation of a black hole. Uh, I can skip that. Uh, but, so I need to have a initial perturbation. So again, inflationary, we saw this week, it is a mechanism that we're going to have produced the first perturbations, right? The first uh, density perturbations in the universe that are going to seed all the things we have in our universe today. And we measure quite well with the CMB. So in the CMB, we have those uh, scaling variant, almost scaling variant perturbations given by this power spectrum. So it's a power spectrum that is almost scaling variant that if you translate into the CMB, explains the CMB power spectrum. And the size of these perturbations is 10 to the minus five. So they are over, they are perturbations in the density of the universe of order of 10 to the minus five. Uh, so if you take into account those perturbations and you ask the question, what is the probability that I'm going to create a primordial black hole? It's almost nothing. So all the perturbations we create in our universe that explains a large scale structure cannot create primordial black hole. Thankfully, right? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. So what do you need to create a primordial black hole? You need to extend this power spectrum. So you need to have whatever theory of inflation or other theory that the power spectrum on large scales, it is nearly scale variant, but then on large scales, you have a peak. Uh, you are allowed to have a very high density on large scales. And this needs to be two or three orders larger on small scales than what we have for perturbations. And there are many mechanisms that we can try to do that with inflation or cosmic streams, bubble nucleation or something. So this is not visible in the power spectrum because it's a really large case. So it's really small scales. It doesn't interfere with our other observations, but it will create a bunch of black holes. So on cosmological scales, these primordial black holes will just behave like dark matter because it's just a massive particle. Like a wimp is a massive particle that, and for this reason behaves like dark matter. A primordial black hole is just a massive particle, but microscopic, and then it's going to behave like dark matter. But since it's microscopic, right? So since it has an astrophysical size, uh, it's going to have this granularity, right? The fact that it has a, a big size, is going to have observable consequences on smaller scales. So you can try to see, if you see primordial black holes using things like lensing, uh, micro lensing, or gravitational waves, because those are black holes, they are going to decay. You're going to have binaries of primordial black holes and all of the things we know for black holes. And you can see here the fraction allowed for primordial black holes to be the dark matter uh, versus the mass in solar masses. Uh, and here we can see things like um, 
Here, this bound is the evaporation bound. So if the mass is really small, if I produce black holes that are very light, they are just going to evaporate through Hawking radiation. I can use gravitational waves. I can use microlensing. And I can try to find these astrophysical objects in the same way that we try to find uh, black holes. But as you can see here in this picture, uh, it seems that it's very hard to have 100% of dark matter in primordial black holes, right? So we seem to be very constrained. Um, not everybody agrees with all of those measurements. Again, it's very hard to interpret what they mean, actually. But I think this picture shows that uh, it might be challenging to have primordial black holes as 100% of dark matter. I don't want you to take this into like, oh, then it's not primordial black holes. Okay, it doesn't make sense. So it's not primordial black holes. Because people usually say, if we have a dark matter sector, it needs to be one thing, right? Otherwise, we're just, I don't know, uh, assuming that dark matter is 10 different things. And people usually don't like these ideas. But what I invite you to think is that if the universe predicts things that behave as dark matter, like the neutrino, for example. Uh, this is maybe not part of what dark matter is, but this behaves like dark matter. So we should discount that out of what dark matter is. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that dark matter is made of many things. It's that the universe has many things that behave like dark matter. And that's possible. So if black, primordial black holes exist and they are not 100% of dark matter, we need to understand how, what is the amount of them that we are allowed to have. So we can factor this out into the amount of dark matter and try to find maybe a particle, maybe something else. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I was gonna, but, but then you more or less slide into it, but this is all just for monochromatic mass functions. It's right? just for it's monochromatic. One, if it's one thing, yeah. then it cannot be. Exactly. Than, this okay, is yeah. actually just for monochromatic, yeah. Yeah. Right. I think I have to stop, right? But we started five minutes later, so I'm going to go a little bit more. Okay, so we talked about particle dark matter. We talked about here uh, the WIMP sector, so thermally produced, so thermal relic dark matter. We talked about WIMP zillas. We talked about bashos a little bit, not too much. Then we explored really macroscopic possibilities for dark matter, which is primordial black holes. And now we're going directly to the other side, the opposite side of dark matter, which is wave dark matter, which is the lightest possible candidate for dark matter that exists. Uh, we also call this not only wave dark matter, but also ultralight dark matter, which is this regime where dark matter can have something between 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 28 EV until EV. So what is ultralight dark matter? So ultralight dark matter is going to be this bosonic dark matter component. Remember our mass bound. So we have the three main gun bound. If it's smaller than 100 EV, something like that, it has to be bosons. So it's a bosonic component produced non-thermally. Again, remember the warm dark matter bound. Everything that is below KV has to be non-thermally produced. So uh, if we have a boson non-thermally produced in our universe that has a very small mass, so mass is around 10 to the minus 57 kilograms to minus, minus 35 kilograms. So this is what I call ultralight dark matter. And why is it interesting? Why do I want such a light candidate, right? First, because it's possible, it is within our bounds, so it's allowed to be dark matter. Second, because it has a very interesting property that might help us try to discover what dark matter is, which is a large de Broglie wavelength. So let's just remember what is the de Broglie wavelength. So if you remember from the undergrad course, the wave particle duality. So everything, every particle we have in our universe can be described as being a particle and a wave. So it's the same property. So particles are both particle and wave, everything in the universe, us, the electron and dark matter could be also particle and wave. Uh, and the De Broglie wavelength, which is the size of this wave that describes the, the particle, it's given by one time divided by the mass times the velocity. So if I have a very high mass, for example, if I have a golf ball, uh, the De Broglie wavelength of that is going to be tiny. So although there is 
at the Broglie wavelength describing, describing the golf ball. This is so tiny that we don't see, right? This undulatory or this wave-like behavior of a golf ball. If I have an electron that has a very tiny mass, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, then the De Broglie wavelength is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this is something more sizable and something that in quantum mechanics experiments can be seen having a undulatory uh, uh, behavior, like we can see here in the double slit experiment, right? So when I throw electrons into a double slit experiment, what I find in the other side is actually the pattern of a wave. Although we have a lot of experiments that measure neutrino behaving like particle. So the wave particle duality is a property that we have for every thing in our universe. So why is it interesting then to have such a small, uh, such a small masses for dark matter? This means that the De Broglie wavelength of this dark matter is going to be of the order of parsec to kiloparsec. And again, just remember, the size of a halo of a galaxy is something like hundreds of kiloparsec or tens of kiloparsec. So this means that dark matter is actually of the size of the galaxy or a little bit smaller than the size of the galaxy. So this is, dark matter has a, the size of a wave of, that represents dark matter. It is microscopic. So that's why it's a very interesting candidate. So this means that if dark matter is within this range, it has parsec to kiloparsec De Broglie wavelength. This means that in galaxy scales, dark matter is going to behave like a wave. So here in the galaxy, what we see, we see the undulatory uh, behavior of dark matter. We see dark matter behaving like a wave. But this kiloparsec wave, if I'm in gigaparsec scales or megaparsec scales, really far away, on large scales, I see this basically like a dot, right? Like a particle. Like we see the golf ball. The golf ball has such a small De Broglie wavelength that we see this as made of particles. So for large scales, the ultralight dark matter with this De Broglie wavelength is basically just seen as a particle. So this type of dark matter candidate behaves like CDM on large scales, and it reproduces the power spectrum in the way that our observations allow us to do, tell us that we should do. But on small scales, again, the small scales are always popping up because this is where we have freedom to change the behavior of dark matter. On small scales, it behaves, it behaves like a wave. Okay, so let's stop a little bit and then we continue uh, talking about wave dark matter.
Can we start again? Okay, so let's go back to ultra light dark matter. Um, so as we saw before the break, uh, one interesting feature of this model and why I call it wave dark matter, although it's a particle, okay, but it's a particle that has a large de Broglie wavelength, uh, is because you have this uh, undulatory or wave-like behavior on macroscopic scales, or scales of the order of the size of the halo. Uh, but how did I choose this, uh, this range here of masses. And you see, this can change 10 to the minus 25, 10 to the minus 22. We need observations to really say. So uh, how do I choose this mass range? So we were talking about mass range a lot yesterday. So how do I choose the ultralight uh, dark matter mass range? So the first one, the lower one is obvious. So this particle has to have a certain uh, De Broglie wavelength, but it cannot be larger than the De Broglie wavelength uh, than the size of galaxies. Otherwise, if it's larger than the size of a galaxy, I basically don't have the behavior of dark matter correctly in it. So I really actually don't measure dark matter in it uh, correctly. So the size of this is going to be that the De Broglie wavelength needs to be smaller than the size of a halo. And for that, you try to get the smallest halos we know the size of the smallest halos we know, like a, a dwarf galaxy or something quite small. And then you can put a bound here on 10 to the minus 25, 10 to the minus 22, something that, like that. The upper bound, EV, uh, is very easy to see. Uh, it is just because the halo has a high occupation number, so I have a lot of dark matter in my halo. And if I have a dark matter that has a large De Broglie wavelength, this means that in the halo, this De Broglie wavelength is going to start overlapping. And when I have that the De Broglie wavelength of those particles is bigger than the distance between the particles, the interparticle distance, then I'm going to have this high, uh, this uh, entanglement of this wave, like they're going to really start adding up or something. Um, and uh, so this gives me this bound here of 2EV. So this is the bound that we call that where dark matter is coherent inside the halo, right? So it can be described in this way. Okay, but what are the candidates that can describe this ultralight dark matter? So until now, we just talked about the mass bound. So it has this mass bound because it has a large De Broglie wavelength. Uh, but what are the candidates? What are the particles, the really particle physics uh, candidates that can describe then this ultralight dark matter? So a natural candidate that we have in our universe for a light scalar, a light boson, it is pseudo number Gaussian bosons. So I don't know if you remember, but if you don't remember, just know every time you break a symmetry, you spontaneously break a symmetry in our universe, you are going to produce a Gaussian boson or pseudo goes boson if uh, you don't fully break this theory. And the most well-known pseudo number goes boson is the QCD axon. So the QCD axon, it was a particle that is invoked, is beyond standard model, but it's still a very good explanation for the strong CP problem that we have in quantum chromodynamics in particle physics. So you don't need to know that. You just need to know that there's a very good motivation from particle physics. So this is a particle we expect it exists to solve the strong CP problem in QCD in the standard model. Although we never detected it, uh, it, is one of, it is a very good solution for the QCD problem. And uh, this QCD action, if it exists, and it was invoked to solve this problem in quantum chromodynamics, since it's a massive particle and you have to produce a lot, it's going to behave like dark matter. So no one tried to invent the QCD to solve the dark matter problem, the axiom. The axiom was invented for another reason. And you gain for free that it also behaves like dark matter. So it couldn't have better motivation, right? Like they have for the WIMPs, the supersymmetric partners that were there if you have supersymmetry. Here, you don't even need supersymmetry. That is something we don't know if it exists or not. Here, it is something that is here to solve a problem in QCD. So this is the QCD axiom. 
The QCD action has a mass around 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus five EV. So it's very, very light, but not as light as the other masses we're talking about. So we still have something to get to 10 to the minus 22 and 10 to the minus EV. But for that, if I do other modifications in the standard model of particle physics, or even coming from string theory, or even coming from some models of inflation, you can create what we call axon light particles. So they're not quite the axion. So the axion has a very strong relation between uh, this F here, which is the symmetry breaking scale and its mass. So the mass is always related to F. There is a fixed relation and this is the QCD axion. The axon light -like particles, they are produced by other mechanisms. So I could have a beyond standard model theory or a string theory. And this string theory has some extra very light fields around. And we call those axon light -like particles or ultralight axions. And those can have masses that span all this range from 10 to the minus 22 EV to EV. So they are, uh, not as well motivated as the QCD axion, but they still appear in many beyond standard model uh, theories. Uh, but one important thing for dark matter, for whatever dark matter, is that you need to have the correct abundance today. This was the WIMP miracle, right? That's why WIMP was so great. So for the axon or axon light particles to work as dark matter models, you have to produce them and have the correct abundance today. So for the axions, it depends on the initial angle, uh, and this is not important, and the, this uh, F, so this constant, this uh, symmetry breaking constant. And for axon light particles, it depends on the mass and on F. So you can play with those two quantities to have the correct amount of dark matter. And there are many mechanisms to create that that people have invented in the literature. And uh, so for spin zero, for scalar, the most well-known mechanism is the misalignment mechanism. Uh, just for those who like this, if you don't care about this, don't worry. But uh, it needs only to be a boson, right? It doesn't have to be spin zero. So it can have any integer spin. So it can also have spin one candidates like fuzzy dark, uh, vector dark matter or spin two dark matter. And there's a few production mechanisms that people have invented to produce them but it's very hard. It's very hard to produce something very light. Um, right. So for dark matter to be in this range, it can be many different things. So it can be those axons and axon like particles that I said. Uh, you can have vector dark matter, right? So you can have something that has been one. And you can even have other stuff that appear on, on string theory here. So there is indeed a very huge what we people say axiverse or zoo of axon-like models that can appear in theories. And how do we detect them? How do we know that they're there? How do we know that they can be all the dark matter and explain all the evidence that we have? Again, very pictorically, you could do exactly in the same way as the WIMP. We can try to detect them directly. So those are not going to be recoil experiments because this is really light. So if this, hits, I don't know, xenon, this is not going to do anything. There's no recoil, this is really light. So I have to be smarter than that. I have to do something different to try to measure this directly. Those are really light particles. So scatterings are uh, very different, right? I can try to have indirect detection. So is this uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, interacting with a neutron star or a black hole or gravitationally? So I can have cosmological or astrophysical searches for them. And this is usually um, the, the biggest um, amount of evidence that we have. So first let's talk about the cosmological signatures of this. And for the cosmological signatures, I'm going to focus more in the even lightest range of the ultralight particles. Why? Because the lightest it is, the biggest the de Broglie wavelength it is. So you're going to have a, a, a more distinct behavior on small scales because then it's going to behave really like a wave on scales of the order of the galaxy. So I'm going to focus here 
in masses around 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 20 EV. Okay, so if I have this type of dark matter, um, I can have many different models to describe. So it's not just because I have an axon light particle and know exactly how it behaves. Again, like for WIMPs, like for dark matter, I can say that it self-interact or it doesn't. So if it doesn't self-interact, we call this model fuzzy dark matter. So it's just one particle, right? It doesn't self-interact and it's just there, just a light particle. Or I can say it self-interacts. So it has a small self-interaction between itself. So this is a self-interacting fuzzy dark matter. Or it can be even something else completely different, which is this model of dark matter superfluid. So even though we call them axon light particles, there is like even very, very different ways of describing those models. So very different dynamics that those models dark matter can have. So let's talk a little bit about the fuzzy dark matter, which is the simplest one. So it's just having a very light particle under gravity and see what are the observational signatures of this model. So this is sometimes called wave dark matter or ultralight axions. Uh, and again, uh, it can have spin zero, spin one, or even higher spin. So we have uh, different types of mod models for those. I'm going to focus on spin zero here because this is the most well-constrained model. Uh, right, we talked about this yesterday. So yesterday we talked about how having this scalar field, this uh, ultralight boson, in the universe evolves. So if I have this scalar field evolving with this type of potential here in a Friedman Hobson Walker universe, it's going to behave like dark energy at early times. And then when it's on the bottom of the potential, it's going to start oscillating and behaving like dark matter. And you remember, we even had a mass, a bound for the mass giving this behavior. But this is the relativistic behavior. We're now going to talk on, about how dark matter behaves on small scales. And for that, we're interested in a non-relativistic regime of dark matter. So the cosmological way that it behaves is well known, and we know it behaves like dark matter. So cosmologically on small scales, uh, we know the behavior. But on small scales, how, how different it is the behavior from, for example, uh, a particle uh, in a Newtonian theory. So if I take the non-relativistic regime of that equation of motion, actually the equation that describes how my dark matter behaves is actually the Schrodinger equation. And if you remember quantum mechanics from our undergrad, Schrodinger equation is the equation that describes how the wave, uh, the wave function behaves, right? So here I already see something very different. So dark matter is not described by uh, a particle-like um, equation. It is described by the Schrodinger equation. And this Schrodinger equation is coupled to the Poisson equation, which tells us how the gravitational potential with this, how is this big phi changes with the density of dark matter. So this is usual, but how dark matter behaves is very differently than if you had a particle. It really behaves like a wave. We can rewrite this equation in form of a fluid because this is something we're more used to, right? For CDM, we wrote CDM like a fluid. So we had a fluid that had no pressure and we knew exactly how to describe a CDM fluid. So I'm going to try to write this equation in a fluid form. And for that, I do this change of variables here and I get this fluid equation. So the first equation here, um, it's exactly the same as we would expect for lambda CD, for CDM. But this equation here, which is the Euler equation, has an extra term here that we call quantum pressure. It is not quantum. Everything I'm doing here is the halo of the galaxy, so it's classical. I have high occupation number of galaxies, so it's classical. But quantum pressure is a name that comes from condensed matter physics because having a bosonic system described by the Schrodinger equation, this is well-known in condensed matter physics. This is a Bose-Einstein condensate. We see that all the time in condensed matter physics. So this term appears in condensed matter physics and they call quantum pressure because there you're actually in a quantum system. Here we are in a classical system and we have this extra term that is actually going to counteract gravity. So as we saw yesterday for CDM, one of the properties of CDM is that it clusters on all scales. It has a CS zero, 
So it has the infinite number of Lie wavelengths. Oh, sorry, Jing's length. But what happens when I have quantum pressure, something that is going against gravity? The Jing's theory then is the following. While gravity is here trying to make things cluster, quantum gravity is opposing that and saying, no, 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 you cannot cluster. Where those two are in equilibrium, I have my Jing's length. So when quantum pressure is in equilibrium with gravity, then I can define a Jing's length. Inside the Jing's length, I have no structure formation. Right? Sorry, I just said the wrong way for CDM. I'm so sorry. So for CDM, you have zero Jing's length, right? Because then everything outside the Jing's length is going to grow. For this case that you're going to oppose gravity, you're going to have a size here, a finite size Jing's length. And inside of it, quantum gravity wins. So you don't have formation of structure. And outside this Jig's length, gravity wins. And then you have uh, clustering normally as CDM. So just with this picture, you can already see that for fuzzy dark matter, for autolite dark matter, clustering is going to proceed very differently, right? So I'm going to have a size here where I don't have clustering, that I cannot form structures. So gravity doesn't cluster on scales smaller than the Jing's length. And the Jing's length for a very light particle, something like 10 to the minus 22, is kiloparsec. So all the interior of the galaxy, for example, is going to cluster very differently because you cannot allow clustering on scales like 55 kiloparsec. So imagine the impact of that in a, in a halo of 200 megaparsec. And this is going to have very, very strong consequences, observational consequences that can help us try to probe the nature of dark matter. So the first one is the suppression of small structures. Uh, so as we have been talking uh, since yesterday, we cannot suppress structures until 10 megaparsec inverse, K equals to 10 megaparsec inverse. That is where we have very good observations, but uh, for smaller scales, you can. And if you have fuzzy dark matter, that's exactly what happens. So here I'm showing a simulation that our group, uh, Simon May from Max Planck, that is my collaborator, did. So here on the bottom, we have CDM. And on the top, we have fuzzy dark matter. And even by eye, we can already see that the CDM simulations have a lot of small structure. So this is the universe that we expect if we have CDM. But if you have fuzzy dark matter, all of the small scales are not going to be formed because I cannot have clustering on small scales because I have finite Jing's length. So you're going to have a very different universe, a universe that have mostly the most massive uh, structures and not the smallest structures. Uh, we can write this better, writing the power spectrum. So this is the same power spectrum we have been showing yesterday. So here is a dimensionless power spectrum. Here's K. Here's the 10 or 20 megaparsec inverse. Uh, Region. So here we are highly unconstrained. Here we have very strong constraints. And we can see that depending on the mass of this, we are going to have suppression of the power spectrum on different scales. So even by eye, you can see that those three here are already excluded, right? I cannot have those small masses. Those are too light. And those are going to change the power spectrum where I have very good data. So nothing on the white region can happen. But I'm just showing here to illustrate how the fact that you have this quantum pressure, the fact that you have this wave-like behavior that counteracts gravity on small scale is going to, to have a suppression of the power spectrum. And you can already see that that is very similar to what we showed for, for example, warm dark matter or even atomic dark matter, right? So this um, is the generate, this type of signature is the generate with, for example, wave dark matter. All the, uh, sorry. Um, Oh, with warm dark matter, sorry. With warm dark matter, although the reason why you have the suppression is very different, right? Here is because you have uh, a Jig's length that is finite. And this type of suppression on small scales can be also shown in the halo mass function. So the halo mass function basically tells you what is the size of the halos that you expect in your theory. 
uh, in CDM, because you cluster in all scales, you expect here the dashed line, you expect to have halos in all scales. But if you have a 10 to the minus 22 EV dark matter, uh, you are going to see that you only have halos that have a mass higher than 10 to the eight. So your universe doesn't have halos that are smaller than 10 to the eight. So imagine this is a very different universe than CDM. Everything proceeds differently. Reionization proceeds differently. How the distribution of galaxies is, how galaxies form, right? We saw from Frank that galaxies form hierarchically, right? You have all this. This is very different in this type of models. Uh, you can also have the formation of solid 20 core. So the same reason why we had in linear theory, because of the genes length, you have the suppression of the power spectrum. This means that when you form the halo in the nonlinear scales, you are not going to have the cusp that we have for NFW expected in CDM. We actually have a core. So we have a constant density uh, in the interior of galaxies. And we can see that from simulations. So we can actually solve the cusp core problem with this type of model. So instead of having a cusp profile, we expect a core. Uh, because of the genes length, again, because you cannot form structures on small scale. Another really cool, um, really cool uh, signature and something that really shows you this wave-like behavior are these wave interferences. So as you can see here in the simulations, as the halo is forming, since dark matter is basically a wave, you're going to form these interference patterns. So constructive and destructive interference patterns as waves that we have in a pond uh, that we know. So this really shows that ondulatory, like the wave-like behavior of dark matter. And here you can see better in those two pictures of simulations. So you really have those interference patterns that you expect for waves. Uh, but for dark matters, this is the halo of the galaxy. And actually, this constructive and destructive interference patterns mean that I have regions in my galaxy that have order one over densities. So you might expect that this, is, this has consequences for, uh, for observations. Um, there's other undulatory effects like formation of vortices and everything, but this is too much for today. Oh, sorry. Uh, and the last effect is dynamical effects. So for example, let's say that I have those uh, interference patterns and my star, for some reason, instead of being in the destructive interference pattern, which has low density, finds this constructive interference pattern where I have higher density. So this is going to do the heating. So this is going to transfer a lot of energy to my star. So I can expect that stars in a halo like this, they are going to have a larger dispersion relation because they find those substructures inside the halo, those over densities inside the halo that give them energy. So that actually heat them. And also friction, but this is less important. So given all of those uh, things that we expect, this phenomenology that wave dark matter can have, we can use then observations to try to constrain them. So do, do we see interference patterns? Do we see a core in the middle of the galaxy? Do we see the suppression of the power spectrum? And we can put bounds on the mass of fuzzy dark matter. So here is the mass. And here are the bounds from different systems, from different analysis. All the highlighted regions are forbidden regions. So regions where you exclude. So those are exclusion. Um, uh, bounds, uh, and they come from many different uh, systems. For example, this one comes from the CMB and large-scale structure. So the large-scale structure in CMB tells us that we cannot have 100% of dark matter if the mass is smaller than 10 to the minus 24. So CMB large-scale structure, and these are really precise data, tells us that it has to be heavier than 10 to the minus 24. But I can use other systems. I can use strong lensing systems, or I can use uh, the dwarf galaxies, I can use stellar streams, I can use something super cool that is called super radiance. So super radiance is if I have a rotating black hole, this black hole finds this field of very light dark matter. So like we have Hawking radiation that a black hole radiates photons with super radiance because you have the rotation, 
this uh, uh, rotation is going to uh, excite a, a, a cloud of ultralight particles around the black hole. So black holes in this scenario, they actually have a cloud of ultraviolet dark matter around them. And this changes a lot the signatures for gravitational waves and all these things that we have. So we can put some bounds here. Uh, so we don't have to pay attention in all of them, but you can see that since those effects are really strong, you can actually put bounds on the mass. And nowadays we don't believe or we don't think that it can have a mass like 10 to the minus 22. And if you believe in those bounds, it means that the mass needs to be something around 10 to the minus 19. But all of those bounds need to be taken with a grain of salt because they can have a lot of systematics. For example, as always, the presence of baryons, right? So how do we deal with baryons? Baryons are degenerate with some of those effects that we just talked about. So it's very complicated to put bounds. So those are the gravitational bounds that we have in this ultralight dark matter. Uh, so axions, they can be light, but they cannot be so light, uh, right? They have to be something bigger than 10 to the minus 21 EV. But axions they, or axon-like particles, they also interact with the standard model of, uh, of, with our standard model of, with ordinary particles. And this means that there is a tiny interaction with electromagnetism. As we saw, this interaction can be tiny, can be up to milli charge. So I can have this channel. And if you do the axon, the, the, the QCD axon, that solved the strong CP problem. This QCD axon has this a characteristic that is to interact with the standard model uh, electromagnetically. So this really couples to photons, but also couples to fermions, it couples uh, to electrons and protons and everything. Very tiny coupling, but it does. Uh, if you don't like Lagrangians, don't pay attention, but if you like Lagrangian, this is the Lagrangian of the axion, and here's the coupling with uh, the, the gauge sector, right? Uh, so you have for the axion, you expect that the axion has some processes like that. So photon-photon uh, conversion, so I can convert an axion into two photons, or I can have photons converted into axions, or if I'm in a region where I have a very strong magnetic field, this axon is actually going to be converted into a photon or vice versa. So because now I interact with the electromagnetic sector, although very lightly, all of those things are allowed now. And I can try to try, I can try to go into astrophysical systems or even build direct detection experiments that take into this account, right? So I want to, to try to create an experiment that is going to convert my axon into photons. So this is a way of trying to detect the axion. Um, and because I have this interaction with the electromagnetic uh, sector, actually my, uh, uh, my Maxwell's equation change. So if I don't have the axion, these are the Maxwell's equation, the ones we learn um, in undergrad. But if I have the axion, although this interaction is tiny, I'm going to have modifications in my Maxwell's equations. I call these extended Maxwell equations or I call this axon electrodynamics. So this is going to actually alter my Maxwell's equation. And this can also be used then to try to find the axons. So let's say, for example, I have an atomic clock. So it's an experiment that measures um, quite well time because you know the difference between the states of an atom that you put there. So you know exactly how to go from one state to other, right? Uh, you know the, the, the levels of energy quite well. If I have an axion, these energy levels are going to change slightly. So then I can measure the presence of axions. And there's many of those really cool ideas on how to measure the, the axions. For example, if I have an atom interferometer, uh, so I have an atom uh, in, a, in a cavity, and this atom is very sensitive to tiny, tiny changes. So you actually use this to search for those mechanisms that Devon was talking about, like chameleon. And so it's very sensitive to extra forces, fifth forces or many changes in forces. So if electromagnetism changes a little bit, those atomic interferometer experiments will be able to see it. Uh, what else? Um, 
They have something called torsion balances or cavity experiments. Uh, they have laser interferometry. So if I have a laser system, a laser coming from here, it reaches here. Uh, and then I'm going to make this do many times this um, interferometer, interferometry. Uh, this means that if I have a change in electromagnetism, I can try to um, take this change into uh, consideration in this experiment. So there's many cool ideas. This is a completely new field. So most of those experiments have already existed for something else, for condensed matter reason or whatever. And now they're being converted. They, you can try to use them also to search for the axion. Uh, and this is what it has been done lately with many of those experiments. But also we have been building new experiments dedicated to um, see what the axon or axon-like particle is. So like I said, the WIMP was the biggest candidate. We spent a lot of money in it um, back 30, 40 years ago until today. Now is the time of the action. We're doing the same. There's a huge amount of experiments and we are building dedicated experiments because five, 10 years ago, we were all repurposing experiments. And this is really cool, right? It's really cool that we can measure the action with an experiment that were there to measure the, uh, something else. Uh, and we were repurposing them for the actions. Funny fact, gravitational waves also do the same thing. Gravitational waves also change a little bit electrodynamics. And you can repurpose all of those experiments to try to probe for gravitational waves. So now we have a very cool field on dark matter that is not only repurposing those experiments or trying to find new ideas for experiments to probe the axiom, but also using them to probe dark, uh, gravitational waves. So we don't need LIGO, LIGO is for a certain frequency, uh, if you have, if you want to search other frequencies of gravitational waves, you actually use exactly the same experiments and you use exactly the same effects. Um, and then using those experiments, we can put bounds on here is the bound on the mass and how much it interacts with uh, the photons, right? So here is the axion, uh, the axion photon coupling. And you can go into this website, it's really cool. They have all the bounds um, and he keeps updating them. Uh, and here we can see how this is growing really fast, this field. So we already have a lot of bounds from astrophysical um, systems like indirect detection. So something like the Primakov effect. So I have a neutron star, a neutron star has a very strong magnetic field. If there is an axon there, this axon is going to be converted into photons. Do we see that or not? What are other places in the universe that we have large magnetic fields that you can think maybe the sun, maybe around earth and all of those, we have been trying to look for them and put bounds here. But also those experiments, you have bounds um, in this. And you can expect that this is going to change a lot and really fast in the next few years. Um, okay, but uh, yeah, and you can also look for like astrophysical indirect detection experiments and you have those bounds, but those are all in this plot. Um, but the axon also coupled with electrons, also coupled with neutrons, and you can see those bounds, but also couples with protons and so on. So you can really try to start for the axon almost in every region of parameter space. You see here the, the perimeter space region changes a lot here. We have large masses until 10 to the minus 12. We were talking before about 10 to the minus 28. So you have to have those different strategies to try to probe the different masses and different couplings of the axiom. Okay, so another type of axion or axon light uh, particle model is a superfluid dark matter model. And maybe not a lot of people heard about it, but I think it's super cool. And I don't have time to talk too much about it, but really quickly, um, just to explain the general idea. So like we were saying before, it is still a, a light particle, an ultralight particle, something like EV, 
So it's going to happen the same thing. On large scale, it's going to behave like CDM, and on small scales, it's going to have a different behavior because it has a large de Broglie wavelength. But because of the way you write this theory, uh, the way you model it, on small scales, it actually is going to start to behave like MOND. So remember I, what I told about MOND. MOND, it doesn't work in all the scales because you don't have dark matter, right? But here, what I'm doing, I'm saying dark matter should behave like MOND. So on large scales, dark matter is behaving like CDM, doing what it has to do, explaining the CMB, explaining clusters, explaining in everything. On small scales, where it has this wave-like behavior, I'm going to make find a way to describe it to behave exactly like MOND. And the way you can do that is by using superfluids. Superfluids, they follow exactly those equations we showed, the Schrodinger equation. Um, so if you have a type of system like that, it has to be a little bit more complicated than that. But if you have a superfluid, this means that on small scales where you have all that those waves are superposing and you have what we call a condensate, this is going to actually behave not like individual particles, but it's going to behave as collective particles as we have in a Bose-Einstein condensate or in a superfluid, right? So the premise of this theory is that on inside uh, galaxies, dark matter is going to form a superfluid. Uh, and this superfluid has a behavior, has a dynamics that is exactly the MOND dynamics. So then I can explain all the successes of MOND. Like I told you, it describes quite well the rotation curves. It describes the scaling relations. But you have dark matter. It's dark matter that's doing it. So it can also explain the large scales. Um, and just for those who like Raganjas again, you can do this by having a P of X theory. And this P of X theory has a fraction, uh, an X to the three halves with a fractionary power. Uh, it is a very interesting model. It's a very phenomenological model yet. So it's starting, we're starting to develop this type of model but it gives you the best of both worlds, basically. So that's why I thought it was interesting. So people don't even want to talk about MOND, but wait, <laughs> maybe MOND the way it was done, it doesn't work, but maybe there's something interesting there. Maybe they found an empirical relation that makes sense and we just need to work harder to maybe make dark matter behave like that. Uh, and so that's why I think it's an interesting model. Uh, so yeah, this is called superfluid dark matter. I did, uh, so this was invented by Lasha Berijani and Justin Curry, um, and it's a lot of work. So if someone's looking for a really cool project, this is a really cool model and it needs a lot of work. It's just um, a phenomenological model at this point. Uh, dark matter, a lot of people ask me also, dark matter can be a spin one field. Uh, it can be a, new gate field, yeah, it can. We have many models for that. If you don't like Lagrangians, don't look for it. Just think that we can have a totally new gauge sector. So I have the gauge sector that explains electrodynamics. I have another dark sector that has, that, that dark matter is. And those models are called dark photon. Um, and they are very cool in the sense that we can make them in inflationary models, we can produce them and they have very strong bounds that we can also impose into them. This was just for curiosity for some questions that were asked. Uh, but then you can ask me, okay, I don't care about dark matter. So I should say, number one, you should, because the model that you call lambda CDM, you don't know what is lambda and you don't know what is CDM. So this is a standard model of cosmology that receives the name of the two things that we don't know. So you should know how it is, what it is, dark matter, you should care. But in a practical sense, I do cosmology. Does this change what I do on large scales? Or just those small scale things you're talking about, and this is for those who care about small scales. And I'm going to tell you, it does change cosmology. So tiny, tiny changes in the London CDM paradigm can have important implications in large scales as well. So as Frank was saying today, we have we make a lot of assumptions on how dark matter behaves. So we can do everything he did, for example, he assumed lambda CDM. A question important is like, what if I deviate a little bit of that? Another questions are the tensions or whatever name you wanna call them. 
maybe, uh, and this appears on large scales, right? This appears in our cosmology. We are all having surveys that measure as state and they have this discrepancy. Does dark matter have something to do with that? Yes, dark matter could probably also be one of solutions if this is a problem at all, right? So this has implications on large scales. For example, here we have a, uh, a solution for that state tension. I'm just showing this an, as an example of how dark matter could also change cosmology, um, large scale cosmology. Uh, so for example, if I consider fuzzy dark matter, so if I consider this ultra light dark matter, but here is really light. Here is like 10 to the minus 24 or 10 to the minus 25 EV. So in this range, dark matter cannot be 100% of dark matter. It has to be a fraction. So again, we go back to that thing, oh, but I don't like dark matter being many things. But if axons exist and axon light particles exist and primordial black holes exist, those behave like dark matter. So you have to take them into consideration. So let's say I have a particle that has a really light mass um, and I wanna take the par spectrum again, like we did. So what is the par spectrum of when I have a neutral light particle, we saw it, it has a suppression, right? So it has the suppression on small scales. But this also depends on the fraction. So all the power spectrum that I showed you until now assume that dark, dark matter was 100% made of that thing. So when I show the power spectrum of warm dark matter suppressing, I assume that 100% of dark matter is warm. When I show fuzzy dark matter suppressing, I assume that 100% of dark matter was fuzzy. But that doesn't have to be the case, and that's actually not the case for lighter, really light dark matter. So how much is suppressed? It is also going to depend on the fraction, as we can see here. So for example, we have here this, uh, my, this is, I, I don't know, purple. This purple thing is suppressing scales. It's 10 to the minus 24 EV, so we expect that suppresses scales, uh, but it has this density, so it's going to suppress the scales in this, this manner. Uh, but you can have something in a different mass, but a different amount is going to suppress very differently. So it's the generate, the suppression of the power spectrum is generated on the mass and the fraction of dark matter. And this is going to be very important for S8. This is going to, this allows us to change the value of S8 because you're changing the power spectrum on scales, on small scales where the S8 is important. So if we remember here, what is the definition of S8? So the S8 is this combination of omega matter and sigma eight, and sigma eight is calculated in this way, right? So basically, sigma eight is, oh, is this correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So sigma eight is then this over density that we calculate in this eight megaparsec region. So here showing in a pictorial way, this is the, the bolts that are important for the S8. That's what this uh, gray region means. So when I calculate S8, what are the scales that are important of my power spectrum that influence S8? And then are those scales here that are in gray? So we can already see here uh, on, uh, on this uh, color lines here that some models with some fraction or some uh, mass of dark matter are going to impact X8. So although this is really light dark matter, tiny impacts in the power spectrum can already alter S8. And this, is, <laughs> this can be seen here. So the presence of these ultralight axions can lower S8 significantly for the tension, right? Not a huge thing. So if the mass of the axon is between 10 to the minus 27 and 10 to the minus 25, um, as we can see some of those curves here. Uh, so these people here did an analysis using Planck and Boss, um, and they saw that the presence of these ultralight particles in this range can actually make the tension or discrepancy that you have that is 2.6 sigma, you can transform this into a 1.7 sigma, which for many people is consistency, I don't know. Um, I'm not saying this is a solution to the S8 because we don't even know if the S8 is a problem. I just wanna illustrate that a tiny change 
in the power spectrum, which comes from a different dark matter model, has impacts in cosmology and in the parameters, cosmological parameters that we take, right? So we're always assuming CDM and everything in our analysis. Uh, so those things can impact. And not to overextend, but axons and axon-like particles are very important. For example, if you have the Hubble tension, there's this solution that everybody knows that is the early dark energy. Uh, and early dark energy is just an axon-like particle that is ultralight. Um, and other models like this one here, chameleon dark energy, puts together early dark energy and, and um, axon-like particles. I thought I had, okay, I'm late, right? Okay, so just to say the future is amazing. We were talking about the small scales and we're going to have a huge amount of data coming from the small scales in the near future. I love a plot that I saw in a conference showing that we are actually during a period that is quite calm. In one or two years, we're going to have huge amount of data and all of these pictures are going to be changing. Uh, so we need to really work on simulations and new probes to be able to, to work on dark matter. So basically, we also need to work on how to extend this part spectrum to small scales. So we don't know how to model this well yet. So what do we use? How do we probe the small scales? How do we push this part spectrum to small scales? So there's a few ideas. I don't have time, but this will be in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, Right, so just going to leave you with my summary slide. Again, in these lectures, I hope I showed you uh, what is what are the properties of dark matter. And here you have your dark matter builder's guide. I hope you understood what is the landscape nowadays and how critical is this problem, right? 90 orders of magnitude, it could be from a black hole to a particle that it's almost a quantum, uh, <laughs> object, uh, but we are making a lot of progress, both in astro and cosmology, but also in direct detections. So I hope at least I gave you a general idea of, all, of some of the models that we have, and also how much freedom we have to write models. And we use that freedom, as you can see here. We create a lot of models, but we also try to measure them quite well. So thank you so much for your attention. But that, let's just take a break. Stretch legs and is that okay? Yeah, and we'll ask questions on my brain is not working. Slack.